All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at National Young Writers Festival for our Trans and Gender Diverse Showcase. We are very excited to be here to be presenting these beautiful writings uh, and to be part of a festival that we all love very, very deeply. Uh, I'd just like to take a moment before we get started to acknowledge the true custodians of the lands that we are broadcasting from. Um, the Wurundjeri Wodong people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, uh, to the Awabakal people, uh, and to all other elders and communities uh, of those various lands that everyone is presenting from. I would like to recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, and, you know, honouring tens of thousands of years of storytelling, culture, and and divinity and sacredness, recognizing as well the disproportionate impacts of colonization on trans and gender diverse Aboriginal folks and those who exist outside of the gender binary, Aboriginal brother boys and sister girls, uh, and the systemic discriminations that are still in place and our responsibilities to end those. My name is Navozisson. I use they them pronouns. I've been running this group with Alison for goodness, two and a half years now. Mm -hmm. um, I am an author. I've written a couple of books on trans topics, Finding Navo and the Pronoun Lowdown. Uh, I am recently a TEDx speaker. Uh, I run workshops in schools and workplaces all around creating more inclusive space for trans people and being less of a jerk. It's very hard work. Uh, I'm also a marriage celebrant and I do a bunch of things so that I'm never bored. And that's cool. Um, and I love the Writers' Festival. I've been involved for a few years and feel very excited and lucky and blessed to be bringing you these amazing writers. Alison. Thank you, Nev. Um, I am Alison Evans. I use they, them pronouns. I am a queer young adult author. Uh, my books are Ida, Highway Bodies and Euphoria Kids, which are sci-fi or magic. Um, and I'm in a couple of short story collections, Kindred, which is a queer Lovers YA anthology, and Hometown Haunts, which is a horror Lovers YA anthology. Um, I live on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people, I, and I'm also a children's bookseller by trade. Um, this group we started in 2020 during the big lockdown um, because Nev was talking to who would someone who would become a participant um, and they were like I love to write I feel like a lot of um, trans spaces are focused on activism but sometimes I don't want to be an activist I just want to write down stories and so we started the group with Melbourne uh, City of Melbourne Libraries and they have funded us ever since we meet um, once a fortnight on a Tuesday over Zoom and so young people from all around this continent join us. Um, all right, our very first speaker of the evening, speaker, presenter, writer, creative, uh, is Gabby Cadenhead, who uses they them pronouns. Gabby is a poet and composer living on unceded Gadigal slash Wongal land. Their creative practice is one of intersections between story and sound, between performance and protest between queer bodies, feminism, and the sacred. Thank you. I've got um, three short poems for us. The first one is called, Remember. You are enough. You are enough. You are enough. Recite it in front of a mirror until it embeds itself in your facial features. Write it on a page by hand, again and again, in different phrase combinations. Entwine it with theology, self-love made biblical, made legitimate, made possible. Perform it before a community that loves you because they need to hear it. Whisper it in the dark between flannelette sheets and spiraling anxiety. You are enough. You are enough. You are enough. 
until you believe it. My second poem is called Sky, which is these first two are ones that I've written in response to prompts in this group. The sky cracks open and I fall from it. My first breath, the dying whisper of a cloud. Lightning crackles from my bones. They carry the power of me, which bursts forth uncontainable. I soften into rain, these tears that hold my darkness and my strength. Watercolours tug the horizon into sunset, pulsing with the gradient glow at the heart of me. I find myself there in the bleeding of purple, pink, orange into pale green, and with the universe, expand. My last one is called, We Watch Each Other Grow. We watch each other grow. Tend roots newly replanted in queer soil. Water ourselves with words to curl around. Celebrate every fragile shoot and pruned thorn. Surround each other with queer love until we are a forest of our own making. Thank you, Gabby. That was so beautiful. Uh, now, next up, we have Luce. Luce is a queer fiction writer and illustrator coming, currently living in Melbourne suburbia, Nam. Their interests include cheesy fantasy, watching cartoons, and pretending to know everything. Thank you, Luce. Thank you, Alison. Um, yeah, my name is Luce. I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Banarong and Wurundjeri people. Um, and I'm just going to be reading the first scene of a short story I've written. Um, the story is titled Apocalypse Chasers. It was originally based on a prompt from this writing group, uh, but it sort of became its own thing. Um, but yeah, I just have the first scene for you today. It's the end of the world and they're out of milk. This is one more problem than Rue usually wakes up to. They glance up from where they're scrubbing a metal muffin tray and wish that they could skip out and work today and hit up the store. If only the apocalypse could wait. Outside, a scarlet storm sits bloated and boiling on the horizon. The unnatural glow of two bright lightning tears through the sky above neat suburbia and bleeds through the lace of their kitchen blinds in ugly, dizzying stutters. The shops might be closed anyway, they think idly. Hey, close the curtains, Crow calls from the kitchen table. Rue turns to see her half buried in a stack of ancient tomes. The morning light is oozing across the page she's trying to read like a pulsing neon blood splutter. Rue sighs, but obliges. With the final dawn muted behind thin curtains, they leave the tray to dry, turning their attention to the steaming cup set down on the counter. Two mugs, one to-go cup, a tea bag in each. It's just a little possession, they say, trying to sound confident. Time and tea will fix it as good as it always does. The empty milk carton sits guiltily in Rue's periphery. The last of it had gone into their batch of baked goods. Sure, but like, my family are exorcists, Crow stresses, trailing a finger down yet another index page in a gesture that somehow manages to be aggressive. It's dumb if there's nothing in here that can help. Crow, Rue has found, likes to be helpful. She cares in this raw, earnest way that leaves them a little unmoored. Like, she loves so much that it's not enough to just say it. She has to do something about it. But because she's also a hot mess of a woman, she sometimes tries to express this through means of ancient, powerful magics, which never quite works out for anyone. It's sweet, though. Aggressively sweet. Somehow. From the cupboard above the counter, Rue pulls out a little purple bottle shaped like a teardrop. It's distinguished from bubble solution only by the label, which reads, Ghoul be gone, in cheerful, bold black letters. Two drops and two sugars go into one mug, a spoon of honey stirred into the other. They set the tea with the honey on the table, Crow hurriedly clearing a space for it. Her bedhead never really sorts itself out. Rue brushes frazzled black strands back and plants a kiss to Crow's temple as she pretends to grumble. Try not to stress out over it too much, okay? They soothe. So long as he drinks this, Nesta probably needs company today more than anything. Crow doesn't look convinced. Before she can argue, a flash of green light erupts from the bedroom, alongside a loud, achoo, Rue sighs. Speaking of, they follow the sneeze, leaving Crow to her research. Nesta is sitting halfway up in bed. 
he looks pale and exhausted. Rumpled is a baseline look for Crow, but on Rue's other partner, it just looks like it just looks like sickness. It's always a bit rattling seeing someone who irons his ties sweating through one of his partner's old band shirts and coughing into the oversized sleeves. The glow is still fading from his eyes when Rue perches on the edge of the mattress. With the hand not holding the mug, they press the back of their palm against his forehead. Rue, Rue, he complains. I feel so gross. You look gross, Rue replies. There's a thick glob of ectoplasm dribbling from his left nostril. Both of them cringe when he sniffs and it retreats back upwards. Rue removes their hand to pass in the box of tissues. That's bead, Rue Rue, he says in a very nasally sing-song, but takes an offered tissue all the same. The dusty little ghosty is already saying such big things. If I've ever to recover, I will need to be complimented constantly. They wait patiently for Nesta to blow his nose before handing him the mug of tea. Please, they laugh. That ghost is the one trapped in there with you. It's true, he replies, imagining to sound a little dangerous, even through the congestion. I always bite back. The grin he's wearing is as sharp and well-dressed as Nesta always presents himself. It's almost a muff to convince Rue their fretting is for nothing. Then he looks down at the mug he's holding. Rue, he starts, still grinning. There's no milk. Uh, they scramble to think of something clever to say. But all that comes out is the truth. We read out. I used it for the muffins this morning. A disconcerting pinprick of green has appeared in the centre of Nesta's pupils again. I always take milk in my tea, darling. Rue gulps. Well, it has the medicine in it, they try. So maybe just this once you can... There's a roar of cold fire. Rue shields their eyes from the ghoulish light and so hears only the oddly wet thud of cracking ceramic as the mug is hurled at the wall. When they feel it's safe to look again, they just sigh in exasperation at the dripping wallpaper, the mess lit up miserably in lashings of emerald. I can't drink black tea, Rue! The pissy ghost possessing their boyfriend growls out in an echoing version of his voice, blocked sinuses and all. There's acrid greenish smoke spilling from Nesta's mouth. It's too bitter! Ectoplasm is dribbling from his nose again. Oh, dude, they wince, noticing a bit spilling from his ear as well. Gross. Nesta screams in offence, and Rue is flung suddenly from the room in an angry flash of paranormal power. They land in a heap by the kitchen table, groaning. Without looking up from her books, Crow hands down to them their own travel cup of tea. Rue takes it gratefully, along with the helping hand also offered, taking a sip as they let themselves be pulled upright. On second thought, they say, slightly winded, Keep reading. Crow hums in destructive acknowledgement, still holding Rue's hand as she bends her head down at a funny angle to kiss it. Have a good day at work. Thanks, guys. Our next speaker is Echo. They, them pronouns. Echo is a non-binary teen writer living in Nam on Wurundjeri country with their family and cat. They love writing poetry, wearing bright colours and experimenting with art in all its forms. Um, I have three pieces today. I wrote one of them in this workshop um, and the other two I wrote in my own time. So this is the first one. Echo. That's the name you use now. That's not the name you used then. Maybe it's not the name you want. You tried to reject it, you know. You thought you could banish it squish it but it stuck in your mind and it grew and it did not let go from your attempts to shake it off it sat in a corner and whispered its name and you ignored it like elisha pushed daniel from the room but echo you need to face it your name is calling to you it's not just whispering now it is yelling unabashedly screaming wake up don't be confined by the limits of girl You've tried it on already, and you know the tag's itching you. It's digging in above your hip. It's never, it's never fit. Not really. Not in the way it matters. So shed that shit, girl. Free yourself from the mortal constraints, the clothes society so violently sewed for you. Rip the seams and fly. And this is the second one. The compliment slipped into your pocket. The glass of water by your bed, the message sitting unopened on your phone. Are you all right? 
the smile, oh, the smile that bursts blooming from your lips, a twist of joy, of surprise. You didn't expect such kindness today. But when you smile that lovely little grin, my heart grows and swells with love because that is the reason I exist. My biggest joy is the joy I feel when you feel it too. And maybe that's the point, to be happy together and unworry all things tangled. When I'm with you, I don't need anything else. All I can do is stare at your beautiful smile. Um, and this is the last one. The night air bites at my nose, wind tugging at my hair in frantic attempts, pulling me further into the field of the unknown. You are more apprehensive, shielding your neck against the chilly fingers, the air drags down your spine, with the shawl your grandmother made you when you were five. But I grab your hand and follow the stars, hung low and glittering in the wide expanse of black that shrouds the midnight sky. My toes bare and freezing in the soft, pretty earth, itch with excitement as we run unbridled. And your laugh nestles itself into the hidden crevices of my heart. We are bathed in silver and stars, stiff pit fingers pointing the paths between the twinkling pinpricks and the sky whirls and the stars spin and our minds entangle and we collide and your kisses mimic the infinite artwork above us. And we collapse and curl up on that cool and grassy hill. And we are just two lovers watched by thousands of those before us, twinkling in singing the songs of the ancients that lull me into sleep in the arms of the earth and the sky and you, my forever only universe. Thank you, Echo. Um, next up, we have Maddie Godfrey. Maddie is a poet living on Wajak Munga Budja, and I think perhaps is the author of the best poem about new cats that I have ever read. Hi, um, thank you, Alison, and thank you to all the writers in this group who have uh, nurtured my writing uh, and my confidence and my joy so much um, last two and a bit years. I'm gonna read one poem, which was started in this group. I don't remember the prompt um, and it's ended up, um, it'll be in my forthcoming book, which is exciting. Uh, the poem is called Uniform and it starts with a quote from Mary Jean Chan. Most mornings you see the face of a boy in the mirror. You expect to fall in love with him. The bricks my father laid in his primary school days, visible from our mailbox. Still, I wasn't trusted to carry the girl of my body across two suburban streets. She was heavy and shadowed like a cloud about to burst. She was an adult sized backpack that engulfed my child sized wingspan. If dictionaries define uniform as something that remains the same in all cases and at all times, unchanging in form or character, what is the word for a uniform applied differently to different children. My blue pleated skirt, an aspirational short. The first time I complained, it was because I wanted to play soccer on the school oval. Still, I concealed, made my reasons more feminine, more pastel, more likely to be heard from a watermelon lip smacker mouth. Claimed I wanted to cartwheel. A decade since, my body has never achieved such inversion. Mostly, I wanted to thud like the boys who pushed their scuffed knees against the doorways of classrooms. I wanted to wear dirt like a personality trait, like a tough badge, like the way gravel gets in your palms but doesn't stay inside after the skin has healed. I didn't want to be a boy. I just wanted to try boyhood on to eat my lunch with my legs bent and spread, my crotch a glorious landscape of gray material, a body allowed to walk itself to school. 
Thank you. Yay, thank you so much. Oh, so beautiful. It's so wonderful to hear everyone's sharing, especially knowing that some of those pieces came as a result of this group. Um, <clears throat> there's a word in Yiddish that is um, nachas, and nachas means like it's like a kind of pride, but it's like a familial pride. It's like how you kind of feel it in the depths of yourself. Um, and and that is that is how I feel tonight. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for sharing your hearts and for being here. Um, our next reader is Alex. Alex, who uses he, they pronouns, is a queer teen living on Bungarung country. He loves drawing, writing, playing the guitar, and basically doing anything creative. I'll be reading the short piece I wrote. Oh, to be Ophelia, to be the most vibrant rose in the garden, to be the one who calls for thy affection most evidently, to be without fawns and to have petals as soft as lover's cheek upon thine own. Oh, to be Ophelia, to have thou hold me at an arm's distance, but hold thy love ever close, to hold it within thy hands and grasp it between my fingers. O oh, to be Ophelia, to have thou speak with me in the dark of night, to promise me marriage and impossible fantasies, and to feel thy lips upon thy own own. O oh, to be Ophelia, to be the object of thy every desire, to have thou feel love and adoration for my every god gift, divine flaw and of meager perfection, and to have thou think of me as the ultimate to thy journey. O oh, to be Ophelia, to hold thou as a lover would, to not hold thou as a friend to whisper love-stricken confessions and have them answered in the form of whispers, to not hold thee as thou leaves this grief-stricken earth, and to hear mine own name instead of Ophelia's, O oh, not to be Horatio. Thank you, Alec. Um, next up, we have Julian, who uses he, they pronouns. Julian is an autistic, genderqueer film reviewer and novice VN dev based in the engine. He insists he's human, but his schedule suggests that he's a vampire. If you attended QUT's 2016 Create X Day, you may have seen his work in the Altered States event. We do not talk about his mic failures on that day. This is his first time participating in a writer's festival. He will be reading a piece based on the prompt, What Sound Does a Giraffe Make? Written in 20 minutes as a challenge. Um, slash. He will be reading a short story called Koda Kazam. Greetings, mortals, and thank you, Alison, for the introduction. I will be reading a short piece written during our writing group one day based on the prompt, What Noise Does a Giraffe Make? The giraffes of Wilmont Zoo thank the star of Zephon every day humanity asked what the fox says. The biped's obsession with their domestic companions predisposed them to wondering about small, furrier creatures resembling dogs and cats allowing the ones they dubbed giraffes in their human tongue to remain beneath suspicion. For the question, what does the giraffe say, cannot be answered with a sound from a human tongue, nor the mores of what humans dub animals. No mortal words can adequately describe the sound of the so-called giraffe, but perhaps the closest would be eldritch or Lovecraftian. If humanity grew curious about the sounds and language of giraffes, it would surely spell their own doom and they would be laughing all the way at this hilarious new meme as their eyes vaporized. Hiding in zoos, pretending to be mere animals, has provided us with generations of cover, but I fear we may be forced to drop our masquerade should the what does the fox say meme continue onto other animals. Yes, the consequences are far from ideal, but I wager humanity would prefer this option to a living nightmare. And so, every night, I pray. May the star of Zephon help us all. Okay, um, I am just going to read a poem from a verse novel that I'm doing. Uh, I start. I had the idea for it in this writing group. And so this is after a friendship breakup. Dear Saint B, I hope that we can see each other soon. I know that I was too much and I know I said things that were too sharp. I know I'm saying too much and I'm sorry. The things that fell between us, I want them back. The silence in your room before we go to sleep. The groans as we walk up the hill to school. The clink of coins in my pocket when we get to the milk bar. 
But most of all, I miss the art, the sound that we grew like a garden, like your mum's garden that always survives the summer, no matter how crispy the grass gets. I hope we can recover from this, my cleaving us apart. I always said we were going to do great things. You said we were doing them already. I know what you meant now. I wish I had known sooner. With all my love in song and in sweat, in the blisters on our fingers, in the way we look at each other and don't have to speak a word. Um, I also forgot to mention, I did that when Maddie Godfrey hosted our group one time. So thank you, Maddie, for that prompt. Yay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read a piece that I wrote in this group for funsies. Uh, this was, the prompt was a weather report on another planet. The stars will swirl atop your head, combusting with your outbreath. The wind is feeling affirmative today. Will whisper, you are loved as you go about your errands. Although the clouds will be blue, they will sprinkle pink dust. So do not worry for they are happier than they appear. Also, do not worry, you do not have to be. The late afternoon brings with it a multiple lunar eclipse. We predict a cup of tea and kiss from a loved one will help reignite the brightest moon. Moss will grow very tall around 6 p.m. Make sure your cats are indoors so they don't become wild jungle beasts. Unless, of course, you want them to. The moss will drop around 8 p.m. and so too will the birds take their slumber. It's best your house cats or wild beasts are indoors by this stage. The songs of the sirens will commence at 9 p.m. Do not be lured by their singing, lured, lured by their singing, for they are only practicing. The night will be cool and comfortable. We hope you sleep well. And the other one I will read uh, is also. Thank you to Maddie. <laughs> Everyone's very productive in Maddie's workshops. Um, <clears throat> the uh, prompt was imagine a cafe or restu restaurant or other public space filled with queer joy. Tell me what it looks like. This is a first draft. I've written more drafts since, but um, in the spirit of this group, I am sharing a first draft because I think it's really important that uh, writers get to see what people's first drafts look like because sometimes we write things and we're like why isn't this as perfect as the book that I just read and that's because the book you read is on its 57th draft so here's my first draft in my queer heaven there is forgiveness in the water fountain that moisturizes lips as it is drunk the seats at the table have been constructed deconstructed reconstructed so many times Everyone has decided to sit on the floor now. With the discarded furniture, we whittle keys to let others in. There is no stairway to heaven. There is a ramp with walls that stretch far from each other, but that still hold the roof up together anyway. In my queer heaven, we write poetry and stick and poke tattoos on each other's backs. Promise to read out the parts you can't see until you know it well enough to recite it yourself. And still, you will ask me to read it anyway. Paint my nails with the grout of our efforts of building something from nothing. Make fashion of resistance. My queer heaven smells like the blend of expensive perfume with cheap drinks and sweat. Tastes like a home cooked meal after a long time abroad. Looks like the glitter glistening long after it's time to go home. Leave queer heaven in my bed like the makeup you were too tired to take off. Dry queer heaven with my favourite flowers. I will keep the bouquet on my dashboard as I drive to your house. In my queer heaven, every person is an altar of their own making. Their ancestors weep honey at the sight of them. There is no death, only knowing, no discovering, only remembering. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kate. I'm non-binary. I am far more comfortable with public speaking and writing fan fiction than I am with poetry, but I'm enjoying dabbling. I spend my time trying to find and create community with queer people and also being hyper fixated on a different crafting hobby every month. This work is called An Orange. 
The words tumble out like an orange from a supermarket bag. Careless. They glance at it, they shrug, sometimes they apologize. Oh, I'm probably not meant to say that, am I? They reach out and put it back and forget. But when the orange tumbled as it hit the floor with a thud, you and I look at each other. And for just a moment, our souls spill outside of our bodies, like tide pools overflowing, our little waves bumping against each other. In that moment, we smile and we mourn, the way the world should be. The words are a hailstone, a sting endured over and over. You are locked outside during a hailstorm, the onlookers impassive. The hail passes directly through your body, plinking to the ground. The holes close over, divoting the skin. In one deep breath, together, we fortify ourselves. Like the moment before a tattoo needle breaches the skin, a pain that must be pushed through. And because we witness each other, we know that pain is real and it is wrong, but through it, we push. For without each other, we would never know that we create the tide. We, all of us, grab onto the lip of a cresting wave and together pull it down with a thunderous crash onto the rocks and erode them. Or are we like the moon, siren calling the waves into being? Because the larger the moon, the greater our gravitational field, the more orbiting rocks are pulled in, the more we find each other and the louder our voice is that raises the tide. So as eyes meet, as water swells, we know together who we are and we turn calmly back to face the world and say, oh, don't worry about it. That concludes our trans and gender diverse showcase for the National Young Writers Festival. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to everyone for being involved. Thank you, of course, to Jess for all of their incredible digital programming work and the editing and the transcribing and all of the things. Um, thank you for joining us. If you are interested in being involved in our group, uh, anyone between the ages of 13 to 25 are welcome. Uh, but in honesty, I will not be carding you at the door. So if you want to join, feel, <laughs> feel free to join. I'm not that kind of bouncer. Uh, and we would love to welcome you. We are online, on Zoom, free, available. You can tap in and out as you like. Um, that's all from me, Alison. Mm -hmm. Also, thank you to City of Melbourne for funding the group and for making it happen. Thank you, Erin, for always wrangling all the Zoom links every week and all the emails. Um, we couldn't do it without you.